Welcome in to the Hot Read Podcast live on a Master Sunday. I'm your host, Easton Fries, director of published content here at broadwaysportsmedia.com. We're also brought to you by the 440 Podcast Network. You can follow me on social media at Easton Fries. I am joined as always by producer JT, who you can follow on social media at JT underscore Runky. JT, how are we doing? I'm, who won? Scotty Scheffler, baby. Ran away with it. Uh, he's dominating golf. He's dominating life. Yeah, he's unstoppable. Care. Yeah. All right, cool. That's I. That's the only. That's the only Masters answer I needed. I, I hadn't watched a single other thing, except <laughs> I, you know, Max Homa. I heard was pretty electric. I, I was, was kind of rooting for him to win, but he was hanging around. Really it, so Scott, yeah, Scotty's a little bit. You got a little Darth Vader going on right now. Unstoppable. I'm, I got my my. You could argue my Tiger red on today. Got my uh, my Masters hat on. Feeling good. Uh, players were out there playing good well actually really just scotty the rest of the guys fell apart augusta national golf course difficult hard golf course i know that you told me the other day you think you could do better than what tiger did um which is funny and wrong um uh, anyways we're talking about football today we're talking about the big meaty men and we'll be doing both the offensive tackles and the interior offensive line we're covering all the guys all the big fellas up front on the offensive side of the ball in today's episode and we brought along the only man for the job to help us talk through some of these big fellas He's Stoney Keeley. You know him. You love him. He's all over the place these days. He's over at the Sobros Network, of course, where he does uh, writings and musings and recordings of all sorts, as well as now a full-time member of the Football Another F-Words podcast here on the 440 Podcast Network and a multi-time guest friend of the Hot Read Podcast. Stoney, we are so happy to have you. How are you doing? I'm tired, boys. I'm tired. Uh -oh. Already. We are we are Not at good. the uh, there's a little light at the end of the tunnel trying to get this stacking the inbox draft guide together. Mm. Zach and I are hard at work to get this thing delivered at some point this week. But I have been like the last 48 hours of my life have been staring at a screen, watching tape, refining evaluations and getting my lists and rankings in order. And I'm kind of like, you know, if you open my window right now and I see a sliver of the sun, I might cringe i might melt a little bit but we're just we're powering through man we're powering through coffee and gin. gin coffee and the you know what that's what the doctor ordered to keep you that's going I, I, <laughs> it's the healthiest way to get through draft season yeah uh you know you got to respect the body treat the body like the temple that it is and that's, that's right uh, that's what we're all doing here we got i mean shoot it's the draft is a week from thursday so we've got like thir 14 13 wait no 12 days 10 11 Something days like not many days left i don't know <laughs> um, but I know that Stoney is going to be cranking out content until we get to draft weekend. Uh, everybody here at 440 Sports is going to be drafting, uh, cranking out draft content. I'm already losing it. And we here on the Hot Read Podcast are going to be cranking out draft content just to give you guys a rundown of what our schedule looks like for the next couple of days. This week, we have got a number of shows coming your way. We were recording both the interior offensive line and the tackle episode here today live. So you're with us live. That's awesome. We appreciate you being here. We'd love for you to be a part of the conversation. We'll have those episodes coming out on your podcast network of choice and on um, on YouTube later this week. One will come out tomorrow. One will come out Wednesday. Tomorrow will be live again here, a Monday episode of the Hot Read Podcast. A couple of episodes out of the regular schedule because we got a lot of stuff to cram in here at the end. We'll be talking through the top 10, uh, not top 10, top 11 technically, outcomes, ranking the outcomes for the Titans in the first round, which is a really fun exercise. And a number of you helped vote. In uh, I know Stoney at the last minute got his ballot in. JT got his ballot in. So we got a lot of votes. Over 200 people voted. It's ranked. Uh, we're going to discuss what the people want, what the, the trademark capital the capital P, the people have decided what they want for the Titans in the first round. So we'll discuss that on, on Monday. Tuesday, the top 10 running backs, the top 10 safeties, a dual episode then. And then on Thursday, we're doing the edge uh, defenders and cornerbacks. So a lot of draft content coming your way. But let's dive in first here on the Hot Read Podcast today. Let's do the tackles first, fellas, because that is the position the Titans really, truly need. Now, they certainly could use some help on the inside and some depth would be nice. But the top line talent at the tackle position in this class is fantastic. We're going to discuss um, what is easily the most talented group of tackles in one draft class that I have ever seen. And uh, it's a good thing for the Titans because they need two of them. They really they don't have a starting tackle on the roster at all. I mean, I, obviously the left tackle position was solved when they traded away a seventh round pick last was a Friday. I think um, for, I've already forgotten the guy's name, a guy, Leroy Watson, Leroy, Leroy Watson from the Browns. Um, so that obviously left tackles locked down now and they'll be drafting receiver in the first round, right? Cross it off the list boys. Right? Exactly. Um, no, they need a left tackle and a right tackle. And 
Uh, it's safe to assume that they'll be drafting those guys. Um, well, I think the first round, it's likely that they come away with a starting left tackle. And then I certainly would not mind them double dipping at the tackle position. Just an overview of this class. There are, I think it's the top, yeah, the top 11, one, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, excuse me, 13 tackles in this class on the consensus draft board are all within the, the top 103 overall, which is absurd. It's it's insane. The, the top one, two, three, four, five, six, seven of those guys are in the top 30. Now, is that how it's going to shake out on draft day? Perhaps not. But that just goes to show how stupid the top end talent and the depth in this group is. And for a team like the Titans who really need two starters going into next year who are not currently on the roster, if they wanted to try to get a starting tackle in the third round, most years, I would tell you, you, you know, that's not really how this works. You might be able to do that this year, right, Stoney? Yeah, I, I would agree. I think there's uh, there's an opportunity to get a, a stud franchise guy in the first first round or at 38th overall, and I think you can get a, a guy on the right side of the line like a Roger Rosengarten, Christian mm -hmm. Jones, Blake Fisher. I mean, there's a ton of guys. Uh, this this tackle class goes. I was talking about this with Zach the other day, and I, I want to say that I've got like 18 guys in this class that I think could potentially start in the NFL, and that's you know a, a, a safety measure. It's not even counting like the traitsy deep cut prospects that could mm -hmm. develop into something. So like last year we did this podcast, and for me, evaluating last year's class, it was Paris Johnson Jr. and then everybody else. Mm -hmm. And we're talking about like Jalen Duncan and Tyler Steen in my top 10 last year bit of a reach and i you know at this point i'm i'm looking at the 10th spot this year like man who do i keep out of the top 10 because there's so many guys that have really high ceilings in the nfl that i mean left or right i, I think you're gonna get you're gonna get a guy that's got a chance to really play on day three i think back to when the titans drafted dylan radens right he was a second round draft pick like number 52 sure. overall something like that in the in the high 40s low 50s somewhere in there if i recall correctly and at the time, it was like, yeah, sure, okay, a nice, a nice day two tackle prospect who you know may develop into a starter. Obviously, we know what has become of him, and he's more of a depth guy at this point in his career, uh, or an interior player. Uh, but you know, I, I think about okay, where where is that line of like that caliber of prospect? Where's the Dylan Raidens of this group? And, and where he came in on that draft class was like you know the mid forties, low fifties, mm -hmm. mid fifties. That that's the you know the guys on the consensus this consensus board it's like the guys at 103 the the guys at 105 like you mentioned it's the Ro Roger Rosengartens it's it's the uh, you know uh, uh, the the Christian Jones is out of Texas it's the Javon Fosters out of out of Missouri those are the guys that are more of the I don't know but like I like the swing on a day two kind of guys and you're gonna get them falling a number of them may fall into day three this year. For sure. What what do you guys think about comparing the two classes of the last two years? Where do you think Paris Johnson for for you guys would would rank among all of these tackles? So it's a great question. It's one that I wanted us to bring up so we can just go ahead and talk about it. I mean, I I, I regard I regard the the top six in this tackle group as uh, you know a tier to their own. Joe Alt, Ola Fashionu, Talisa Fuaga, Troy Fontenu, JC Latham, Amarius Mims. Those six guys, I think. I think any one of them could arguably be tackle one in most draft classes. Most of them, I would I would argue, are tackle one in most draft classes. Um, and there's six of them in this one class. I I don't know. I, I would put at least two or three of them above uh, Paris Johnson, who I loved a lot and I think is awesome. And that's not a knock on him as much as it is, uh, I think, a reflection of how highly I regard these top six guys. I'd have him as tackle three or four in this class, I think. Maybe be fifth for me. Yeah. Okay. And maybe, yeah, I, if I really sat here and thought about it and like really tried to parse it out, I'd have a hard time picking who I'm putting below him. It's, yeah. it's, it's a hard conversation to have because it's like you have Paris Johnson jr. Who has a year of NFL experience underneath him. And that's always now going to like, right. Like He's proven in he hindsight, thing. right. He had a good year uh, in, in totally. hindsight. He had an up and down year, but mostly towards the end, it, it looked really promising and what you mm -hmm. wanted. And, as much as we talk about how good these prospects are, it's also important to to realize that the NFL playing tackle is really, really hard. And you don't see, we, we talk about these top first round prospects as guys who we down the line, we think are, are going to be generational starters. 
it, but time and time again, we see that in the first year, that's not really how that works. It takes time for these guys or second and year. So, Sometimes it takes exactly. Multiple, right? it, it takes, it takes a little bit and it's cause it's really, really hard. And they're going up against really, really good defensive players every single down. Um, but with that in mind, I think looking at the prospect as himself uh, from last year to now, I, I for me, I think it's it would be hard to put him any lower than I think tackle four. I think I'm like right in the middle of you two, mm-hmm. um, because I think there are a couple of in that in that top five when you're talking about a Troy Fatanu or a, a Marius Mims, they have a few more knocks on them or, or things in their game that I think maybe lend themselves to taking a little bit longer to develop at the left tackle position than a Paris Johnson who came out and and was really able to play the position from the get-go. But I I would not put him as the number one tackle this year. Yeah, I think it's just an interesting way to highlight just how good this tackle class is from the top. And that's why I I brought it up. I didn't mean to steal your thunder. I didn't know we were going to talk about it. No, I'm I'm glad you did because... And I, I think it's I think you're right. It's it's a great way to highlight the talent, but it's it's the number one thing that bothers me. I, I think it's the lack of understanding when you get the folks who I saw somebody on on Titans Reddit today. Somebody sent me this screenshot from Reddit where it was like um, somebody was thinking out loud on Reddit about how, you know, could the Titans send a, a late day three pick <laughs> to a team like the Chargers at five just to ensure they don't take a like how can we ensure Joe Alt gets to seven? And I'm like, guys, Joe Alt, who we're going to talk about, spoiler, <laughs> he's my top tackle in this class. I think he rocks. I'd love for the Titans to get him at seven. There, you know, think back to how highly folks are talking about Paris Johnson and, oh, to have him fall to 11 for the Titans last year. I think there are three, at least three guys in this tackle class that are all better than that guy. So to have mm-hmm. a non-Joe Alt at seven, it's, re- it's really super not the end of the world. I promise. It's, it's not a bad thing at all, but we'll get to that. One last question for you, Stunning, before we dive into the actual 10 players that we have on your board and on mine. Talking about these guys that aren't in our top 10, who are, are, are still talented prospects, intriguing prospects, for the Titans in particular, if I told you they take a tackle in the first round, right, they get one of these top guys, and then they address the tackle position again in round four or round five. So they get one of those guys between 120, you know, 115 and, and 160. Who's the, who's the early day three tackle to you that you're like, if I could hand place him on the tight, if I could guarantee he's a Titans draft prospect, uh, I would do that today. Is there somebody that stands out to you in that way? I think it would be Christian Jones. I really liked his tape against yep. Alabama. I thought he had a good week at the senior bowl, not just in, in terms of his, his play during the practices, but kind of, he, he was one of the two guys there that I thought was really getting coached up, but was really open to the coaching. They were kind of teaching him how to strike with his hands. I think he was having problems like going for the shoulder, but like tilting his hand out. And they were like, no, when you do that, your palm's going to strike outside of where you want to hit. And so then on the next play, he's keeping his palm. I'm I'm miming this for the people that are watching on YouTube. This is a reminder to watch on YouTube and not Bingo. just listen to the, to the downloaded feed. But I noticed his hand more upright, driving forward, hitting where he was aiming. And I, I just... I kind of fell in love with that. Like I'm a sucker for a guy that shows he's coachable that can take what he's being taught in real time and applying it to the very next rep. I think he's a scrappy dude. He's powerful. He's long. I think he checks a lot of the boxes. I'm not sure why he was so low on the consensus board to begin with, but he's a guy that if you could get Joe Alt in the first and pair him with Christian Jones in the fourth, man, you got your bookends right there. I'm happy with it. We're rolling with that. Yeah, I, I like a I like a a Jones out of Texas as well. The guy for me that and he may be on your top ten list. I'm not actually looked. Um, I'd imagine he's not though. Roger Rosengarten out of Washington. He falls squarely into that category that I love. The guy that played the same position as another guy in this draft class at the same school, and so he's the <laughs> other one, like that guy who I think is universally uh, undervalued. Uh, that's a Roger Rosengarten because Troy Fatano, the guy that's playing the other the other end of the line over at Washington is going to be a first round pick and is going to be a stud for somebody. I think Rosengarten gets a little bit re- disregarded um, as, you know, I'd say he's a developmental prospect with starting upside. Uh, I'm not, not going to get crazy and say that this is, is going to be a guy that comes in and starts for you right away. But, you know, he doesn't win any beauty pageants, I think, as Dane Brugler put it in the in the beast. But I, he, technically, I think he's very sound and I like the way that he plays and I, I could see him being a starter for somebody. Um, I, I've heard some things from from NFL insiders that are like, this guy is, is somebody that could go on day two and surprise some folks. He could go higher than you think. 
Okay, let's get to our actual top. Sorry, let me let you speak to Roger Rosengarten. What, I, was just, I was just going to point out he's really good with his hands, and I've actually got him at OT11, so he just missed my list. Okay, there you go. I think he's my he's either my 11 or 12 as well. Yeah. So let's get into the top 10 guys here. And before we do, a formal reminder, if you're with us live, we appreciate you being here. Do us a couple of favors. First of all, head on over to Broadway Sports Media's YouTube page. Find this live stream there. So leave Twitter, leave Facebook, wherever you're watching this live. Go to the YouTube page. It's Broadway Sports Media. Hit subscribe. Hit thumbs up. Those two buttons right below this live stream are the biggest ways that you can help us here on the show. If you appreciate the content that we produce, we would appreciate you helping us out by pressing those two things. Helps us with the algorithm and all these things that we don't, you know, who, who cares, whatever. It's Fugazi, Fugazi. It's the internet. Just click them for us. Um, and then join us in the comments. We, we've already got Chef Ran and Brady and uh, Papal and Daniel and and uh, and Shrike and Glory Day Sports already all up in the comments. We appreciate you guys here for the big meaty men today. Um, if you are not following us on social media, it's at Hot Read Pod on TikTok, Twitter, and Instagram. And then make sure wherever you get your podcasts, if you miss an episode live, no big deal. Catch the podcast version on Apple Podcasts, on Stitcher, on Spotify, wherever you get your podcasts. Check us out there because we're there. Okay. Top 10 lists here. Stoney, uh, I've got a guy at number 10 who I want to talk about who I know is not on your list. We've talked about him previously, and you're not as high on him as I was or I, as I am. I recall us doing this episode last year. A certain BYU tackle in last year's class ended up being drafted by the Indianapolis Colts, who I was fond of and fit into my list. You not so much. Uh, he started a lot of last year, and I don't want to talk about how he played because that's not it's neither here nor there. Uh, but he did play in the NFL, and I think that makes me the superior offensive tackle uh, evaluator, doesn't that? <laughs> Isn't that what that means? Let's, um, you know what? Let's let's see how Freeland's career goes before we start victory lapping. Because he had such a great first year, and everybody in Indianapolis was happy with him having to play. <laughs> uh, okay, but but in all seriousness, at my number ten spot is Kieran Amagaji, a tackle out of Yale, who I guarantee nobody knew about, unless you're a big Yaley, I guess, about before this draft cycle. Uh, he's somebody that. Boy, is he hard to find tape on because Yale not putting out a whole lot of all 22. But when you do look at what he has done in his college career, he strikes me as somebody that I think is going to be um, a, a an impressive player at the next level, considering where he played in college, you know, playing on a team for Yale that had a whole lot of nothing playing up against a competition that was consistently a whole lot of nothing. It was a lot of dominance for him. And I know your biggest thing, Stoney, is that you just didn't see him dominant. At least I think you just didn't like that. He wasn't as dominant as you wanted him to be playing at that level. You can correct me if I'm misquoting you. But oh, in a I nutshell, yeah, I, I think okay. that's it. I think when a guy plays at that level, you want to see him just go out and, and you know, let the bodies hit the floor, like just wrecking people. And I, I didn't see that. And I kind of felt like that was a bit of a red flag for him. And, and generally speaking, I'm with you that that's what I want to see. I guess I just saw it differently from what from what I've seen. I've seen enough of that to convince me, you know, the, the traits are there from an athleticism standpoint, from a length standpoint, 95th percentile with length and 85 and a half inch wingspan, 36 and an eighth inch arms. He's got the frame to, to be a dude. Um, uh, 75th percentile weight, 45th percentile height. The, the, the body is there. The athleticism is there. It's just a matter of whether or not he goes to the right situation and can refine some of those 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 fine tuning skills. Uh, but I think that he can, and that's why he's my number ten guy. Um, if, if he were to work, if I'm right, Sony, from what you have seen from him, what do you, what do you think the selling point is on him to say this guy could be an NFL tackle? Yeah, I think you do see flashes of pretty good play on his tape. I think the length and and the athleticism. Are, are clear as day. I, I think when it comes to concerns about him, it's just it's just the rawness. Like I, I noticed times when I felt like he really reached. It's like he's he's used to having long arms, and I'm just going to reach out and grab the guy. Sure. Instead of you know stepping into him, kind of closing the gap, and guys get around him. But I I you know I think there are little little things like that, like working through traffic. I felt like he was a little little clumsy, but but man, when he flashes, I think he's pretty good with his hands, like keeping a mid level kind of coiled and ready to strike, not too high, not too low. I think he's got a pretty powerful punch when he throws it. And I think when he does get his hands clamped on guys, he's pretty sticky and he's got the athleticism, the the wiggle to mirror guys. My concern again to to boil it down to a 
to a sentence is just, you know, if he's not doing this on a snap to snap basis against the Ivy League, mm -hmm. what's going to happen when there's a major uptick in, in competition? And, and I should specify, this is not to say like, I don't think the Titans should draft him, but I, I think if they were to draft him, it's a long term plan for a prospect like this. There's no way. I would be willing to bet one of my kidneys that he's not going to step in and make an impact as a sure. as a left tackle, as a rookie in the NFL this season. And that it'd part be another, I agree with. It'd be yeah. another project, I think, for sure. That's that's for what sure. I came away with him. Um, he also outside of my top ten, uh, when, just when looking at overall linemen here, um, I think there are a couple of, uh, other interesting, just key points about his game. Um, Season ending injury in 2023, which kept him out of most of the uh, draft process in, in, in this offseason. So I think that's something big. But like you said, he's a project guy already coming off of season ending injury. I think for a Titans team right now who you kind of see them bringing in some already developmental pieces uh, with Lee, Lee Watson throwing away or not throwing away, but kind of sending off one of their seventh round picks as a flyer to go get mm -hmm. one of these developmental guys already. Um, you can kind of see that this maybe isn't a guy who would fit into what Bill Callahan in this offensive line group wants to do. Yeah. I would also add this. He does have some experience playing right guard at Yale mm -hmm. as well. He did play some snaps there. So, I mean, this is another guy you're talking about. I feel like every tackle in this class is like, Oh, just kick him inside to guard. But I feel like he is a, a good candidate for something like that to make his impact felt sooner on the field, but also, you know, not rely upon him right away as a tackle. Absolutely. So let's get into the guys that we have in common here. Your number 10 tackle and my number nine tackle is Kingsley Suamatea out of BYU. For reference, by the way, Kieran Amagaji comes in at number 73 on the consensus draft board. And Kingsley Suamatea is right there on the fringe of day one and day two, 44th overall. I would expect him to be very solidly in the top half of the second round to go somewhere. I'd be very surprised if he slipped into the first round, which has less to do with his talent and more to do with how many incredible guys are in front of him, frankly. But he's a little bit on the light side, 326 pounds. Uh, excuse, excuse me. Take that back. A little bit on the short side. Had it backwards. 15th percentile height, six foot four, but a little bit on the heavy side, 326 pounds, 80th percentile has the wingspan that you're looking for, has the arm length that you're looking for athletic enough of a player played at BYU. Stoney, what makes him worthy of being in the top 10 conversation? I think it's it's the combination of the the power and the uh, the speed. He is a pretty freakish athlete, and I, I think he packs a hell of a punch when he hits. I started my evaluation of him for those that have kept up with my draft coverage pretty pretty regularly throughout this cycle. I started with the Texas game with him, and apparently that is like the worst possible game you could start <laughs> with with Sua Matea because it was not good. I mean, he yeah. was just kind of tentative, missing assignments. It kind of looked like he didn't know who to block. He was misfiring on a bunch of stuff. But then you go and you pop on the Oklahoma take uh, tape. I watched Texas Tech as well. He was at the Senior Bowl as well, and, and you just see like the power in his hands. I, I A fluid athlete that, to me – this might sound like a we're getting really deep into the evaluation here, but how seamlessly he moves his hips uh, to open up run lanes and just completely neutralize rushers is is pretty awesome to watch. I think he's a guy that's because of his athleticism, uh, got a few consistency issues with technique, but what he does flash. I think he can be a lump of clay. Like if you're if you're looking for the quintessential draft and develop player, I, I think. I think Kingsley's got a pretty pretty high ceiling. It's funny you mentioned the Texas tape. I went and because uh, I was, remember reading this the other day in the first sentence under the weaknesses category in Dane Brugler's The Beast. It, it talks about uh, frequently caught leaning and needs to be more conscientious of his steps. It's a run blocker with his pass set depth in parentheses. See 2023 Texas tape. So I think yeah, everybody good. agrees that that that's the low point. But uh, as you said, it's that the size mobility power combination that he presents i think that like you said the perfect way to sum him up he is the quintessential draft and develop guy going to require a little bit of coaching and some patience but i think he's a scheme diverse kind of player that is uh filling all the boxes you're looking for to fit in as a bona fide tackle on your team 
the best comp for him is his nickname, the dancing bear, which we talked about maybe has some before the show has some interesting, you know, uh, <laughs> context to it that I wasn't aware you, of it, but apparently uh, go sure. search on your own. But that's was his uh, nickname on the team and kind of in his play style. Right. He's he's this big guy at 326 who plays with some fluidity that you just can't teach at, at that kind of size. That's the kind of natural talent that I don't know if you believe that that the bloodline can be shared but it is funny to note that he also is cousins with the Sewell brothers so uh Pene Sewell is his cousin you know mm -hmm. he comes from a long line of uh athletes in in family members who did play the position both at the college level and the NFL level um so this is kind of it kind of is in his blood to play uh, offensive tackle. And I think that he has some things in his tape that you simply just can't teach with the intangibles, which like you said, a, a guy who is a developmental guy who probably won't start at the, at the next level um, right away. But I think, man, if you can, if you can mold that clay into something, he can be a fun guy to watch at the NFL level. Yeah, absolutely. Let's move on here to a guy that is on your list, Stoney, but not on mine. And we were talking about this before the show, Jordan Morgan, Offensive lineman out of Arizona, who I have listed as a guard, who we'll talk about for, for my purposes um, in the interior offensive line discussion in a couple of minutes here on the show once we get through the tackles. He played tackle in college at Arizona, and um, we I know going down to the senior bowl, he was one of the guys, Stoney, you were most excited to go and see as a tackle prospect for the Titans who need a tackle. And, and then as we're driving down there, some of the first measurements of the season come out. And it's, oh, Jordan Morgan, 32 and 7 eighths inch arms, ninth percentile. The length just isn't there for most NFL teams looking for that 34-ish inch arm threshold to be able to play tackle efficiently against these crazy, freaky long edge rushers who are just going to get the upper hand on you if they are so much longer than you. And in this case, uh, he would be on the, the, the shorter side against pretty much everybody he goes up against in the NFL. I, I won't stand for this gaslighting. Because last year, I was Mr. You gotta give. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm seeing red. I'm forgetting who I'm even talking. Peter Skaronsky. Peter Skaronsky. Thank you. Uh, you gotta give Peter Skaronsky a chance at tackle. I think he can play tackle. I think he was the best tackle in college. And I know his arms are short. And I know that, like there's numbers that make you say ah, but I don't care. Give him a chance. And then I was beaten over the head with a club for the last year into submission ultimately to say, okay, fine. He's a, he's a guard or, hammock or whatever. They didn't give him a chance. They, they don't think he can play tackle fine. And then here comes on this guy. That's clearly a worse lineman in general. And, and now before the show, you not, I won't say both of you, but JT in particular is like, how dare you put him as a, a guard only and not a tackle when I, I won't stand for this baloney. I, suddenly we can't just rock and roll with, oh, the guy's short, he can play guard. When last year I was told you need to just give up the ghost. It, it's frustrating and I won't stand for it. Noted. I think every, yeah. I think every situation is different. Um, but I, I think it was more of me gaslighting you, which I don't think okay. is a, is a rare occurrence on this show and, and just in general. <laughs> um, but still, I, I, yeah, uh, for me, I think, if you had, it's interesting to put him in context. I think you both have him pretty ranked uh, on both of your lists as soon as we get to the interior offensive lineman as well. If he was a tackle, I think he's in that back half conversation. I think he's close to 9 10 range on there. But if you put him all of a sudden into that interior side, I think he's one of the top three, top five guys in this class because of that. I think when, when you look past his tiny little T Rex arms, you still see a lot of things on, on tape that you like. So, Tony, yeah. what what are the things you like about him as a potential tackle prospect? And we'll get to him in more detail in a little bit. Well, I am like pro give everybody a chance. Like, I do not care. Why not for everybody? And play Skaronsky at left tackle, play Morgan at left tackle. I will yeah. say this. It's, it's pretty interesting that the Titans have spent some time with Jordan Morgan because – they pretty clearly don't need a left guard. So are they just doing their due diligence or it is, is the, is the arm length not an issue um, with, with Morgan? I, I don't know. I just, I just found that pretty interesting. It's not like we've gotten word that they're, you know, sniffing around a whole bunch of guards, this draft cycle so far they could, and we might not know about it, but I just, from what we've heard, I think that's an interesting little nugget. As far as Morgan goes, 
I think he's got uh I think he's got some really good tape. If you if you haven't already, watch him go up against Leatu Latu in the UCLA defense. They've got three edge rushers that are gonna get drafted, and Jordan Morgan was playing with his hair on fire. He's really good balance, like very you don't see him wobble too much in pass protection. And I think he's he's a prize fighter with his hands. I mean, he just seems to have a knack for knowing when to punch, where to punch, when to clamp down. And once he once he does get his hands on somebody, he's able to really ride him out of the play. And it's an endearing quality. But, I mean, to your point, Easton, like the arm length, it does matter to a lot of teams. There are some teams that have a certain number, and if you don't meet that threshold, you're automatically off the board. They're not even going to consider you. So it was a gut punch when we got to Mobile. Zach and I were pulling up to the uh, convention center to get our media credentials when the news came out, and I just my jaw jo- dropped. And I just remember Zach saying, "Oh no, Jordan Morgan measurements are in." I'm like, "I, I, I'm seeing it right now. This is, this is awful." Because he he would have been a guy that if I didn't know the arm length was an issue. I would have said, hey, you know, 38 right there, he's he's capable of coming in and being your starting left tackle week one. Fair enough. And, we'll, he, again, he's a good lineman. I just don't think he's a tackle. We'll talk more about him when we get to the interior offensive lineman here in a minute because he's certainly a top 10 guard if that's what he is in this class. Okay, next up on the list we have – let's go to a guy that certainly has no length issues, and that's Patrick Paul out of Houston. This is a guy we also saw at the Senior Bowl, and he – has the size you are looking for. Man, six, seven and a half, 331 pounds, uh, 87th and 91st percentile, respectively. 36 and a fourth inch arms, 86 and a fourth inch wingspan, 96th and 97th percentile. It does not get any sweeter than that. He is somebody that I know you, you're you a little bit higher on him than, than I am. You have him above a, uh, a Tyler Guyton out of Oklahoma, who we'll talk about here in just a second. I see the two relatively similarly. I think one of them is liable to sneak into the first round of this draft class, but probably not both Uh, on the consensus board. They've got Paul at 66 and Morgan at 36. I think this is lagging behind. I think Patrick Paul is a guy that the NFL is going to like a whole lot, maybe more than most draft analysts in the media. And if he were to slip into the first round, I wouldn't be completely shocked if it, you know, a Kansas city chiefs at 32, uh, you know, uh, one of those teams in the like 28 to 32 range that is in need of a tackle. I could see them going for a Patrick Paul. What are the upsides with with Paul, who I, I would say he's still on the more developmental side. He's got the size to boot, but some of the technique needs refinement. Talk me through him as a prospect. I, I think we're overthinking Patrick Paul a little okay. bit from, from a play style standpoint. The book seems to be really good athletic elite pass protector, but can't run block to save his life. I, I don't really see that. I, I mean, you could, you could point to flashes in every game where he does a good job of getting his shoulders down, keeps his feet churning and kind of eliminates um, the, um, the, the, the rusher on the play. There's a play in particular in the, the Texas San Antonio game when he just completely, like enveloped up, like swallowed a rusher hole and just completely sealed a run lane on a touchdown run that I'm, I'm watching this and I'm like, you know what? I think maybe we're, we're overthinking Patrick Paul here. The length you mentioned is, is awesome. I mean, he gets kind of pulled outside from an edge rusher that, that tries to cross back inside, which I think is like kind of like a, there's a trend among tackles in this class. There's a lot of guys that kind of give up the inside um, mm-hmm. setting a little too far. But with Patrick Paul, he gets a little too far out. The guy cuts inside, and he has these massive long arms that he just like, okay, extends his arm, wraps the guy up, pulls him back into his body, and keeps him away from the quarterback. So I, I think there is plenty that is raw about his game, and I think that he is someone that is going to need a little bit of development. But I don't think he's as far off as the consensus seems to think. And I think you're absolutely right. I've seen a couple of national people say they're hearing whispers that the NFL is much higher on Patrick Paul than draft media is. So I I won't be surprised if he's one of the names that we kind of raise our eyebrows on night one. Like, how did this guy get here? Because I think I think he's like built in a lab to play offensive tackle. And I, I just don't think the weaknesses are as weak on tape. And what you just said there, the, the difference that maybe NF, the, the NFL is a lot higher on him than draft media is because I think when you talk to the guy as well, he, he's just a good kid. He's a, he was a two-time, uh, I believe, captain at, at 
uh, Houston. Um, when you talk to the guy, he, he really cares about about what uh, about his craft, as Dane Brugler wrote it. But you can tell that, that he loves to play football, and, and this is something that he truly loves. And like you said, that's just something that in NFL draft media you just don't get to see. We don't know how these interviews go, but I, I could very much see, like you said, a team really fall in love w- with that guy in, in the late first round, early second round, and, and you see him go a little higher than the consensus is. Um, and I think that's also why he's been such a popular mock for the Titans in the second round. If they were to go with wide receiver, because like you said, he has all of the, all of the traits. He just needs them to be a little more refined, but also his character as well, I think would be a really good fit in Tennessee. He's a fascinating option. If the Titans were to consider taking a tackle in the second round in part, because I've seen him comped a couple of different times to a Chuck Sakura for who's a guy that was on the Titans radar earlier in this process. And I think people were rightly saying, hey, you know, bringing in a Chuck Sakura for would be a nice addition to this team. I think it would fit well. But maybe you have the young version of him at, at the second round in this draft class in a Patrick Paul. How about that? That's pretty spicy. How about I like that? to hear that. All right, let's get to the next guy. How about a little Tyler Guyton out of Oklahoma, who is... Uh, he's my tackle seven, I believe in this draft class, and he is your tackle eight. So you are higher on Paul than on Guyton, but he is most commonly talked about as kind of the runt of the litter of these top tackles. The top six guys get the, uh, the, the, the elite first round tackle treatment. And then there's Tyler Guyton out of Oklahoma in terms of the measurables. He's a well-rounded prospect. He's got the height and weight you're looking for perfectly long enough in terms of reach 34 and an eighth inch arms um, scored in the sixties or higher in all of his uh, athletic testing numbers. So athletically he's there. And I think folks, you know, they see him as a right tackle. Something that goes underrated is the fact that Oklahoma had a left-handed quarterback. So they were trusting him on an Island quite often to protect the blind side of their quarterback. That's something that you don't just let anybody do. I've seen a number of other metrics that that showed he was n- not just on that blind side, but like I mentioned, trusted on an island without help as much, if not more, than any of these guys in his last year in college. What do you like and not like about a Tyler Guyton, Stoney? Well, I, Guyton's tape is a real mixed bag. I mean, there there are okay. times that I would watch him and be like, you know what? Why is everybody hating on this guy? Like he's a perfectly fine right tackle. Then there's other guys. You go, oh, here's why. (laughs) There's other times I watch and I'm like, does he know the ball was just snapped? Like, (laughs) does he know they're playing a football game right now? But I I say Tyler Guyton is the mystery box. He could be anything. It could even be a franchise right tackle. How about that? The when I was talking about Christian Christian Jones and the senior bowl and getting coached up, one of two guys that I really noticed applying it. Guyton's the other one. I mean, they were really working with him on his on his hand usage. He had a bad habit of like wanting to wrap up, like the hands would come around instead of up and into the chest. And so they were kind of coaching him on it and, and he would get the hang of it. And then there'd be like the very next rep, Darius Robinson would hit a spin move on him, cut outside, and the whole time Guyton's just standing there looking at him. I'm like, you got to move at a certain point, bro. You got to you gotta do something. And that's mm-hmm. like what people say about Patrick Paul is what I feel Tyler Guyton actually is. But he is such a fever dream of speed and athleticism that, man, if you hit on this guy and you've got a good coach that can really – develop and lean into the things that he does well i mean you've got a pro bowl caliber like frame speed athletic profile it's there uh you just got to get it out of him a couple of things you notice in in some of the higher level draft analysis and i keep referencing dame brugler as the beast because it just came out it's the freshest on all of our minds gold and standard. it's it, and it's the best right mm-hmm. um you, you catch little nuggets where he very clearly intentionally leaves little hints without out, outright mentioning some things that he's heard some behind the scenes things. And the thing that stood out to me for Tyler Guyton was he goes on in the summary of Guyton to say, uh, as long as he stays motivated and healthy, he will continue on an upward trajectory. When you throw out that motivational word as a Dane Brugler, there's something to that. That's not, you're not just throwing that out willy nilly. Um, so you'd imagine he's heard from some coaches. There may be some motivation issues in the past. And then the, the health thing, that part we know. There, there there have been some reasons to believe health could be an issue for him uh, in his NFL career. But when you set those things aside, I really do think that he's going to be a fantastic 
draft option for somebody in the late first, early second. Again, by dearth of having so many awesome tackles in this class, he's the kind of guy that I think, you know, you'd see somebody come away with at 19 in a regular draft class and their tackle four or maybe five. And everybody's like, ah, yay, they draft, you know, they, they got the maybe the worst ta starting tackle prospect in this class. But somebody in this class is going to get him in the late 20s, early 30s, if not later. And it's going to be really fantastic value. Who was the who was the Jaguars um, draft pick last year? Because I Anton feel like we're, Harrison. Harrison, Anton yeah. Harrison. It, it, does this not feel like the exact same scenario? Well, again, also out someone, of Oklahoma, correct? It, I, I yeah. believe so, yeah. right? This, so. Yeah. so maybe there's something about maybe there's an aura that these Oklahoma prospects give off. Low level starting tackle factory, <laughs> Oklahoma. Um, <laughs> Maybe there's just something to it, the aura that they give off when when coming out of Oklahoma that you just makes them feel like, yeah, they're going to be probably a safe bet to play uh, for a decent time in the NFL. But man, there's just really nothing that jumps out at you that, that really makes you believe that this guy could be an everyday starter from the get-go. And I feel like that's exactly what we're, we get with Tyler Guyton. Now, I do think that he has... Like you said, uh, he has the right pieces. Just putting t putting them together and going to the right situation is going to be um, the big the big p piece for him if he can get to the next level and, and produce at, at that level. All right, you want to move on? Let's get let's get to these top six guys. This is what I'm really here for, folks. These top six tackles who I would I would I'm willing to say they will all be first round picks. Um, barring like medicals behind the scenes that we're just not privy to, you, you could always see a guy fall and it's like, oh, there must be something to it um, that we're not privy to. But assuming that they are all of decent health and uh, they're not massive locker room liabilities, which I don't think we've heard those things about any of these players, they'll all be first round picks. And I don't, in the same vein as the, the wide receiver conversation this year, the top three guys, people have them in different orders. I don't really hold it against you what order you have them in. With these top six tackles, I'm not super holding any order against you with these guys because I think they all have something about them that is undeniably elite. They all have at least one elite quality or a, a level of elite upside or elite size and strength. There's something about them that you can really latch yourself onto. And there's an element of pick your flavor with some of these guys, depending on what your team needs, what you're looking for, whether it's right or left side, stronger run blocker or stronger pass protector. Um, there's, there's a lot of variety in here. At number six, for both you and I, Stoney, and I think the consensus as well, let me double check. Yeah, the consensus board has him as tackle six. It's Marius Mims, Marius Mims out of Georgia, 23 overall. He is the, I mean, is, is it unfair to say he's the model build for a tackle? Uh, he, he, yeah, that's, I'm cool with that. 91st percentile height, 94th percentile weight, 97th percentile wingspan, 95th percentile arm length. 97th percentile hand size, uh, athletic as well. 85th percentile broad jump, which was bonkers. A 340 pound, nearly six foot eight man getting off the ground um, and, and just propelling himself across the, the turf there at Lucas Oil Stadium. Something truly to behold. This guy would be tackle one in, I think, next year's draft class if he'd just gone back to school. Now he didn't, and he didn't really need to because he's already going to be a first round tackle. But he's only got eight starts under his belt with Georgia. There have been some health concerns uh, both in college and then he, I believe it was running his 40 right at the combine where he pulled pulled up a little tweak in one of his legs. Uh, those are really the only things that I'm aware of that are the downside for him. You're, you're, you're not sure the experience, the sample size is, is small, but what he put on tape in those eight games shows a starting NFL tackle, right? I think he has a couple of troubling tendencies. Okay. Um, so I, I don't think it's, I think there's an added layer to the lack of tape. It's that the tape that he does have is kind of inconsistent in my opinion. Anyway, okay. I think he lowers his head and lunges a bit too much and it could be a coaching thing. They could, it could be a play where they're like, Hey, we just want you to, to knife ahead at whatever's in front of you. We don't care what you're paying attention to. I won't pretend to have the, the Georgia offensive playbook at my disposal, but I just noticed several times that like he would lower his head and he would jump and he would take weird angles where he'd end up on the ground. And I'm like, well, I, I don't know what he's doing when he's on. He's a dictator. I mean, he strikes me as like the Hulk waving Loki around in the Avengers movie. And <laughs> it's really impressive. 
I was talking to our buddy James Foster about Mims at the uh, the Senior Bowl this year, and I, I kind of told him about the reservations I had about the tape, and he was telling me his game against Ohio State, the 2022 playoff semifinal game, was some of his favorite tape that he'd watched this season, and he told me the like he wondered if what Amarius Mims's stock would have looked like if he had just not come back for 2023. And that yeah. Ohio State game was the last game that, that concluded his sample size of college film. You know, he's probably a lock to be a top 10 pick. And I think it's really interesting to think about Mims in that regard. It was just because, crazy with even less of a sample size. Yeah, exactly. But to think of the athletic profile, the the freak that he is, the prototypical build, size, speed, all that stuff, like if you're building a left tackle or a right tackle in, in the NFL, you want it to look like this guy. And I think that was the ultimate that's ball of clay for some coach. I mean, somebody's yeah. gonna, somebody's salivating about getting their hands on this guy. Yeah. It, it's a bit of a, it's a bit of a dice roll, but I think that you, you've got a pretty good because the ceiling is so high. I think he's too good to pass up in the first round. Absolutely. And, and I agree with you that if you, if you are, Looking at this guy as why am I drafting what this is on tape in the first round? Like I have some reservations about that. Um, I, I, I mean, I, I can agree that there are some things on his tape. There's inconsistencies. The highs are absolutely there, but there are some mm -hmm. lows that, that concern you. Um, so I, I can get behind the idea of why would you take this guy based on the tape in the first round if that's all it was, but that's not what it is, right? It's the fact that he right. is so young and is so unpolished. You are taking him this high because you're getting kind of a discount on a guy that that shows true top 10 top 5 draft pick ability it's just in in limited spurts and you don't quite know for sure what he is but you think you you see what he could be based on what he's shown us how how is this for a player comp jeffrey simmons <laughs> the tackle version of a Jeffrey Simmons. Yeah, the sure. offensive tackle version of, of somebody's going to get in the twenties and be delighted and probably have an awesome. I I think that he, you know, if 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 I was able to put each of these top six tackles into a you know a simulator and the best outcome for all of them, like I see what the highest highest uh, high is for for each of these guys, I think that Mims is is the best. I, I think yeah. he has the highest ceiling. It's just a matter of whether he gets anywhere close to it. And that's why I, I think that. that's why I think he he still is touted a, as a first round pick. It would be different if he played just eight games anywhere else. But the fact that he played at Georgia, the fact that he had so much mm. success at Georgia, um, even when when we talked to him at, at the combine, um, you know, why do you think that you're ready for for this next step? Um, because despite only playing eight games, his answer, I mean, he was going up against some of the best of the best pass rushers over the last three seasons that have come out uh, right. uh, of the NFL draft every single, every single practice. So I think when you look at it that way, from the system that he's come from, I think I'm with you guys on that one. He, on my board would probably be a little higher. I, I just am that in on, on this guy because of how young he is and, and the, the idea of, of an Amari's Mims. Um, even as glory day sports here, I mean, looking back at, at some of, of some of his high school, uh, tape where he is just maybe three times the size of some other kids, you know, I showed it to my brother um, and he said, were they letting him play middle schoolers? And I said, no, those are high schoolers, my friend. Yeah. It's absolutely insane. It's one of the funniest pictures. If you haven't seen it, I highly recommend um, you go check it out. But yeah, I mean, he it just is the the prospect of of all prospects. Like the, this is the guy that you dream of getting your hands on for for some of these offensive line coaches. And it'll be really interesting to see how high maybe he goes because there may be some people in in a building banging the table for him, saying that this guy w can be a game changer. Yeah. All right. So let's get to these top five guys and let's consult the board here. Um, a little bit of a different order for you and I, Stoney, generally speaking, let's see. So we have the same top two guys and then it's a mix with three through five. Can we start with Talisa Fuaga out of Oregon state, who is my tackle five. He's your tackle three. And I, I have changed my opinion on where he comes in on this list, like seven times in the last two months. Here's why. What he offers is a pretty unique. I think if you look at him in the grand scheme of these top five tackles, his skill set might be the most different in the sense that he is, I think you once put it as uh, don't let Talisa Fuaga find you on the field. Like don't let this man, he's like, he's like 
Michael Myers in, in yes. an old school horror movie. <laughs> if this man finds you and God forbid, get you, his hands on you, it's over. You're done. It's it's finished. He is a nasty, nasty prospect. A phenomenal, easily, in my opinion, the best run blocking prospect in this group. He just leaves a little bit to be desired in the pass blocking category. But what do you see from this guy to make him your third tackle in this draft class? It is the the sheer violence, how easily he is able to displace people attempting to rush. Uh, you're right. I think there are questions in pass pro. I think it's he has a tendency to kind of like the, the way that he sets sometimes it's almost like it's this issue that I mentioned earlier where sometimes guys are able to kind of cross inside. I, I think there are times when maybe rangy guys, I, I noticed Gabriel Murphy do it a couple of times in the UCLA game, are able to just kind of get just below and just dodge his hands a little bit, sink their hips and get around him. And he ends up chasing guys. I, I don't think he's he's got the elite recovery speed to get back to rushers in those situations. But man, it's it, like nine times out of 10, he's going to get his hands on, on you. And I, I thought he, he had an awesome senior bowl week. Mm -hmm. There's a play that like Javon Solomon is running at him full speed. And I swear I, this might be one of those like urban legend, uh, folklore myths <laughs> that have just spiraled out of control in my head. But I swear he just put his arm out, just like politely put his arm out <laughs> and Javon Solomon just completely stopped. Like, like Superman stopping a, yes, a, a exactly. speeding train. Yeah. And, and I'm, I'm watching him and I, I really like JC Latham's hand strength, his, his grip strength, but I don't know that any lineman in this, in this class really fires his hands and uses his hands as a weapon the way that uh, Fuanga does. That's fair. I, you look at the, the athletic and uh, physical profile, 48th percentile height, 78th percentile weight, 15th percentile arms, 25th percentile wingspan, comes in with 33 and an eighth inch arms. Now, that's not necessarily prohibitive, in my opinion, to play on the outside in the NFL. I've heard a, a handful of folks who I respect and trust in the, the draft media market talk about him as somebody they see working best as an interior player at the next level. You know, we've got, you know, we say 34, that's the benchmark and it is for most teams, but we've seen in recent years, a handful of guys with roughly this exact same arm length. come in, play tackle and play it. Well, Panay Sewell, I believe has the exact same length arms. Uh, Rashawn Slater with the chargers also sub 34 inch arms. Those guys in recent years have been top fi top 15, top 10 players drafted, have played tackle and have played it really, really well out of the gate. So I don't see that as necessarily keeping you off the edge as an offensive lineman. But Stoney, do you see a world in which he just can't cut it as a tackle? Yeah, I, I mean, I do. As much as I like him as okay. a as a prospect, it is that play at the edge. Like when he gets gets in there with really twitchy, bendy pass rushers, and he ends up in situations where he's chasing them. I, I don't think that's good. And I think that is something that, you know, we'll kind of have to see how he adapts over the course of his career. But I think I think he does have the athleticism to do it. It may just be a manner of footwork, you know, get in the lab and kind of correct some of these things. And maybe maybe there's there's no issue. But I do think that's the reason so many people project him kicking inside to guard. Fair enough. Fair enough. Let's get to my tackle for your tackle five. Troy Fatanu, who I texted you about a couple of days ago, and I said, man, I just all six of these guys have gotten a lot of press and, you know, some more than others. But if I had to pick the guy that I felt was getting um, not enough, it might be a Troy Fatanu out of Washington. He and I was listening to, again, Dan Brugler on the athletic podcast the other day, talk about some of these guys and and he was saying that whenever we had talked to Western scouts, guys that were covering Western college football, you know, who's who's the guy that you just have no doubt about in, in your entire region, the entire American West. And the guys they come back with are your favorite prospect in this draft class, Stoney. And um, uh, man, I get so bad with names when we just start throwing names out. Help me out here. Uh, wide receiver out of Washington. Roma Dunze. Uh, Roma Dunze. Thank you. I just start blanking. Uh, Roma Dunze. I know. Right. Like, duh. Roma Dunze and Troy Fatanu, both on Washington, both guys that they just don't see being bad pros. He's not the tallest guy in the world, third percentile height, six foot three and three fourths inches, but 63rd percentile weight, 
His arm length, perfectly fine, 67th percentile, north of that 34-inch benchmark. He, he doesn't, on tape, there's nothing that really pops as like, holy cow, oh my God. But it's just so consistently clean. It's so consistently on time, so consistently what you're asking him to do. He just doesn't really miss a whole lot. And that's what I like a lot about a Troy Fatani. What about you? Yeah, I think he's like lighting a firecracker and throwing it in the toilet, you know, like he's just that that's going to explode on every play. And I sure. think he's scrappy. He's aggressive. I I love his hand usage. The The thing that concerned me was like a lack of raw power because of his yeah. his height. Yeah. And when it they ask blow you away kind of, in that in that regard. Yeah, when they when they try to line up and run the football three yards in a cloud of dust, like run down the middle of your defender that's in front of you, he doesn't really have that raw power. But what I think makes him so complete as a prospect, it's almost as if he understands that. And so he's really good at dropping his hips, using his hands to create leverage in the run game. And because of that, he's able to toss guys out the club. So I, I love him. He's scrappy, violent. I think he can play tackle. I think he can play guard. I, I heard some people say, you know what? He's got, the build. He's got the build to play center. Like, mm -hmm. see what he looks like snapping a ball, too. Uh, mm -hmm. One of the most versatile, scrappy, feisty offensive linemen in this class. Fair. Uh, JT, any any comment on a – you know, you want to get to these top three guys? I know we're, we're, we're trying to keep it short and I appreciate you regarding our time here, but I don't want to cut you out of the conversation. Yeah, I, I'm, I mean, I, I am the time arbiter. I, I, I keep, I, I'm the one who continues to keep the show on the road if the we TVA. need to, but you know, exactly right. The uh, Troy Fatanu, you, you versatility is the thing I think with him, as we talk about these different guys, I, I really like how Stoney put with uh, Talisa Fuaga, just like, the Michael Myers aspect of he's going to get you that strength, mm -hmm. the hand placement with, with, with Troy Fatanu, the versatility in his game that like, like scouts have been saying, and like teams have been maybe saying, I could see this guy playing any of the five positions on the line. I, I think you could put him anywhere and he could probably succeed. And I think that's something that is so valuable to a lot of these teams in the first round. When you're talking about, uh, maybe the difference between a, a Troy Fatanu and a Talise Fuaga or a JC Latham in, in in that maybe 10 to 20 range. I think it's going to be very uh, maybe just placement dependent uh, and, and mm -hmm. fit for him to see where he could go. He could go to, to a Cincinnati Bengals and, and sit behind the two Trent Browns and learn how to play tackle at that level. He could go to the Seahawks and be an impact starter right from the get-go in, in the guard. He could even maybe fall to, to a Dallas Cowboys and find himself on the in, in, interior of that line. Th this guy is like, I think, the, the Joker wild card uh, of, this, of this draft that I could see him going as soon as 10 and as late as 25. It's just the preference, I think, in this class. But when, when we talk about these different traits with the, with the top three guys coming up and then also a Fuaga and a Fatanu, the one that I keep coming back to is versatility and the confidence in that versatility. And I agree, it's that movement ability that's such a huge plus for him. However, Stoney, folks talk about him. I mean, maybe maybe you want him on the inside because the idea of this guy is your pin and pull. I mean, a pulling guard in Troy Fatano would be unstoppable. It'd be delicious. And I yes, that, that movement ability would be phenomenal as an interior player. I just, I don't see why you would do that if you needed a tackle because he's, you know what's great as a tackle is being able to move well. And he can, yeah. he can do that. I, I see him utilizing that movement skill on the outside uh, in, in the highest added value to your team. And so I think a team taking him and not playing him at tackle, if they need a tackle, would be pretty foolish. Yeah, I would agree. I think he deserves a shot at tackle, but I also am not going to blame a team that needs a guard and they're sure. sitting there in the 15 to 20 range. And they're like, you know, you, you're looking at the options of a, maybe a Cooper BB or a, a Troy Fautanu, then go with the guy that 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 can move well like i i won't have any gripes with that whatsoever if you're a team in need of an interior player and you have fatanu listed as he's on your interior board is he your is he your guard one with a bullet run that by me again i'm sorry it, I thought... no you're good if you're a team that needs an interior player you need a guard and and you have fatanu on your interior list is he your guard one with the bullet probably i think i think he is for me as yeah. well i, I yeah. can see a team doing that 
Um, let's get to these. Let's get to these top three guys. And Stony, you were once on a fantastic show. This show, uh, talking about a JC Latham out of Alabama, who is my tackle three, your tackle four. I believe you said that if he were a left tackle, he would be considered a top three, maybe top two tackle in this class. Really, no question. Mm -hmm. And Titans fans have generally not been super receptive to the idea of taking him in the first round because they love a a JC or a, a, a Joe Alter Olafashinu more, which is warranted, and you and I both do. Uh, but I I don't see the guy, these top three guys in particular. I see them as really really close. Mm -hmm. Alt, Fashionu, Latham. I like them all, and I think they'd all be fantastic top ten picks. I I, I won't be shocked if any of them are a top ten pick. Just teams looking for their guy, picking their flavor. He's got everything you're really looking for. He just played right tackle in college. Yeah, and, and that was the the context that I think people missed out on because people grilled me over that. They're like, oh, but he played right tackle. He didn't play left tackle. I'm like, no, what I'm saying is mm -hmm. if his tape at right tackle was as good at left tackle, like mm -hmm. if he played left tackle and his tape was as good as it is playing on the right side, he right. would be a consensus top five pick. There wouldn't even be a, a conversation about it. Probably even the best offensive tackle in this draft class. That's how good his tape at right tackle is. I like Latham. I, I think he's a strong, powerful guy, probably the strongest. Uh, if you're just judging based off of the tape, mm -hmm. I think he probably is the strongest grip strength, uh, punch, that sort of thing. I, I think he's far more athletic than people give him credit for. It's like he didn't do the athletic. Oh, but he didn't test now. Tony, so he must be a yeah. A, and now everybody's bumping a log out there. <laughs> yeah, everybody's this guy running with that. I'm like, watch the tape. Watch the tape. He looks plenty athletic. There are times that I feel like he gets pushed back a little bit because he's not as quick to the edge as the rusher. So where you know the spot where they he anchors and he's supposed to to meet the guy edge rusher's already there so like his feet aren't set but he still wins the rep because he's just so naturally strong like just gets his hands on him and and nullifies the rush and and you could point to stuff like that and say okay well maybe in the nfl more polished season guys that know what they're doing can exploit that a little bit and his tendency to not have his feet set on 100 percent of the plays but it's a, it's a very minor nitpick as far as i'm concerned i think this guy is really all four of, of my top four, I would put Fuonga in the category as well. I, I think they're all incredibly polished, and it's just mm -hmm. a matter of pick your flavor. Who do you want? What style do you want? I mean, two two years of experience in the SEC, and he's going to just be 21 years old in his rookie season in the NFL. Um, the 80th percentile length, 90th percentile size. He checks all of the boxes, yeah. and I, I think he'd be a fantastic option for the Titans. If they, if they were to trade back and get a J.C. Latham, at 9, 10, 11, 12. I, I'm super stoked, and I think fans should be too. I'm with you. All right, let's get to these top two guys who I think there's been some overthinking done this draft season. Folks wanting to, you know, move move these guys around. Like, who's the real tackle two? It's Alt and then who? I, you know, during the season, we talked a lot about how actually tackle one is Oli Fashion you out of Penn State and who's going to who's gonna emerge as tackle two. And then things happened, and he had a bad game here or there and, and Joe Alt really established himself as a premier player. And so now we're at the point where he is tackled to in this class, but I think he's pretty firmly tackled to for me for a lot of the same reasons that we loved him during the college season. He's got the prototypical size. He is maybe the best, just pure pass protector in this class. He's really, really refined in that department. What do you love about fashion? New? It's the athleticism in pass pro. He, he's a seasoned guy. He's got consistent footwork, consistent hand placement. I really don't have an answer as to why he's dropping. I, I, I don't know if it's the, the hand size. I don't know if he's getting into interviews and, and telling people he likes to, to kick dogs and cook kittens. I, I don't know why, why he's I heard a little bit if he were to do that yeah. <laughs> because the tape is still the tape. And I, I like his tape so much that I, I told Zach on, uh, I think it was football and other F words a couple of weeks ago that like, you know what, if they miss out on all Adunze neighbors, if they stick and pick Fashanu at seven, I'm not going to complain about Me it. Me neither. Me neither. I, 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 and, and that's not an unrealistic scenario. You know, you could see Alt going at five. You could see uh, uh, neighbors going at, at six. And then, you know, I know that we all love Roma Dunze. There's a lot of reason to love Roma Dunze. 
I think that the smarter pick at seven, if it's between Fashionu and Adunze, I, I'm, I'm still going Fashionu. I think that they are relatively similar caliber. I mean, they're, they're both top 10 caliber draft picks. Um, in a vacuum, maybe Roma Dunze is a higher prospect on your board, but man, this team needs to tackle so badly. Mm -hmm. And I don't think the drop off between alt and fashion new is that big at all. He's, he's certainly worthy of a top seven pick. Fair enough. Yeah, I, I'm completely with you. And people cite the Ohio state tape all the time. I, I, I don't think it was as bad as people make it out to be. And I'm going to borrow a, a take from our buddy, Jake at glory day sports, the difference between Joe Alt's game versus Ohio State and Olu Fashinu's game against Ohio State is pretty marginal. And nobody's talking about Joe Alt's game against Ohio State. So mm -hmm. fair, fair not enough. a big deal. Not a big deal in my book. But the one maybe the one red flag for Fashinu is somehow he has Kenny Pickett's hands. I don't know how. Uh, he's <laughs> zero zeroth percentile hands. I think like eight and a half inch hands, which I, I mean, Stoney, you can maybe speak to this better than I can. Folks talk about like well, the hand size, it matters for the tack for the lineman. And to an extent, I, I think it's more grip strength matters than hand size. And oftentimes yeah. hand size is a direct correlation to grip strength. But did you ever once on tape watch him and be like, his hands aren't strong enough, man? He's he's letting no. these guys loose. No, I had I had no idea. And I, I honestly, not to take shots at any anybody, but I have never once heard anybody say that small hands for an offensive lineman is bad. Right. I think we can for an offensive lineman is bad, but the size hands, does not yeah. matter. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. Small hands. I, I've never heard anybody say that. All right. Let's talk about the number one tackle in this class. He's my number one player. He's your number one player at this position. It's Joe out, Joe out, alt out <laughs> of Notre Dame. I, I'm already not looking forward to the Titans. I'm looking forward to them taking him at seven. I would love for that to happen. I, I, I am fond of that. If they don't trade back from seven, alt at seven, lock it in, run the pick up there. I'm all about it. However, I'm already not looking forward to the fact that we have been on the nuance train with this whole tackle situation, this entire draft cycle. And, and by proxy of talking up some of the other prospects, folks are going to think that we were anti alt. Sure. I've said it as many times as I possibly can. He's my favorite tackle in this class. I think if you are picking a tackle at seven and he's there, you take him. Do I like a trade back option? I really do, but that has nothing to do with Joe alt it has everything to do with where this team is in terms of team building Alt has it all he's a really fantastic prospect 98th percentile height 71st percentile weight um he's got the length you're looking for clear in that 34 inch threshold was elite in college both as a run defender or a, a a run blocker and a pass defender are there any bad things you can say about joe alt stone i mean like maybe the the high end wow blow you out of the water stuff that he put on tape isn't as high as some past top five tackle draft prospects. But other than that, I don't really know what the downside is with this guy. Yeah, I think he's a pretty complete prospect. And I think that's what makes him OT one in my book. It's that you don't have the, the one or two things that you just really question. I think there are times when he's kind of late to anchor. Um, and it, it's funny because you can look at it like, oh, well, he has recovery speed, but then you have to add the layer that, well, there's usually a reason he has to recover mm -hmm. and it's because maybe he's not dropping the anchor as, as quickly as he should. I, I, I like that he has really strong, once he establishes his base, he's got a, he's got a really strong, um, set and doesn't give up a whole lot of ground, but he does stop his feet sometimes in those situations, which sure. not a good thing. Uh, he, he bends at the waist gives a little flexion when when guys try to hit him with speed to power so you know you kind of pair those things together yeah you can probably come up with a game plan to get around a player like that i know um greg cosell was was critical of his his hand Play usage style, basically and, yeah yeah and how he doesn't fire his hands mm -hmm. i see that on tape too you know, I don't think he's got Fuanga's hands out there where he's, you know, delivering knockout punches on every snap. But I do think he's he's good with his hands, independent hands, you know, striking here with the left, moving here with the right, that sort of thing. Um, there there's some technique things that he's just he's really clean on. And uh, man, I, I don't know. Like, I, I just he checks all the boxes for me. That's fair. JT, anything to add about alt? Uh he's going to be the good player the, i'm trying to find a, a negative i think the negative that i keep coming back to is that 
get ready to have zero quotes from this offensive line, but oh, it's a uh, huge, in, he's a huge media negative. Yeah, no, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's I don't think, I don't think, I don't think that's a, a inherent downside. You know, what we <laughs> see from the pony show of the combine versus what he's doing in interviews behind the scenes is something we'll never know. I don't, I haven't really seen anything that would tell me that those have been negative in, in that, in that aspect. I think no. much like a Brock Bowers, he just, it, it, the media side of it is not his strong suit and never will be. He's not filling Taylor make... Lewan shoes, right? He's exactly. not, he's not coming in and being Taylor, not close. But he doesn't need to be because this team just really needs a, a stable guy who can get in there from, from day one. And I think that's why so many people are, are so much higher on a Joe Alt than they are an Olu Fushanu or a fashion or a JC Latham. This Titans team has, has needed a staple guy to hold things down since Taylor went down a year and a half, two years ago. And when you tell them that there's a guy who can do that and fill that hole done, sold, signed, sealed, deliver. However, mm -hmm. If you tell him that this guy maybe isn't able to do it right away, but he can do it in a year, that's where you start to lose them. And I just don't understand because some of the guys who can do it in a year or two, well, when you're really hard. contending, patience is, is no fun. Maybe going to be better. But I like, like you said, all these guys, the top three: J.C. Latham, Olaf Fashanu, uh <laughs> Joe Alt. Right. All three of these guys, I think, if you take them uh, either in a trade back to maybe 10 through 12 or taking them at seven. I think all, all three of them in this system uh, can find a lot of success. You've got alt at nine on the consensus board fashion at 14 on the consensus board. Fuaga at 15, uh, Fatanu at 19, late them at 20. They're all going to be first round picks. I would imagine most, if not all of them go in the top 20. And I think they're all going to be really good players in the NFL. I think they, they all, excuse me. I think they all have the potential to be really, really good players in the NFL. So I am stoked to see where these different tackles fit and see where they develop. And I think the Titans are likely to have one. And I, I will be really ultimately probably happy with any of these guys because they, they rock. So this tackle class is great. And we appreciate everybody listening to the top 10 tackles in the NFL draft class. Now we're going to transition to the interior offensive lineman who will spend a little bit less time on because they are both not as good prospects top to bottom, but also the Titans are in less of a need for them. So a little peek behind the curtain. If you're with us live, this is the start of a second episode. So let's intro this real quick. Welcome into the hot read podcast on a master's Monday, the second of two topics in our live show, the top 10 interior offensive linemen of the 2024 NFL draft. We have Stoney Keeley here from the sub Rose network joining us. And we are talking through some big meaty men Stoney, the tackle class is amazing, but maybe it it's it's glorious opulence is keeping us from recognizing there are some really fantastic interior linemen in this draft class. Yeah, particularly the centers. I think the center class is loaded with day three guys that have athletic traits that that project well to the NFL. I think it's a great year to to need a, a value center. It was something that I had kind of circled for the Titans before they had signed Lloyd Cushenberry. Like this is a need that they can kind of wait on in the draft and uh, still pick up a guy that's going to get some quality snaps. I like the guards as well, but particularly, man, these uh, these centers are going to play on Sundays. I think you're right, and we're going to talk through a handful of them in our top 10 lists. Um, let's go ahead and consult that list here, and uh, I've not compared these guys. So, okay, so we've got the same guy at number 10, and it looks like essentially the same. This, I think we have the same top 10 guys, so that's good. That's very That makes our, our job easy here. Let's start with the 10th guy on our list here in Mason McCormick out of South Dakota State University, not San Diego State University. Um this is a guy who is going to be playing the guard position at the next level. He's your number 10 player on the interior. Stoney, what, what do the people need to know? What's one big thing about Mason McCormick that makes him a, a good prospect in this draft class? He's a thick, girthy guy that plays like a bullet, man. He gets into space mm. and he just looks to blow through somebody. I don't think he's the quickest guy, but man, he is, um, he is a heavy hitter. Okay. Fair enough. Um, these 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 last couple guys because like for reference mason mccormick coming in at 142 on the consensus board he's going to be a day three guy a couple of these guys here at the bottom are going to be day three so let's let's focus on the the big picture with some of these guys and at number nine bo limmer out of arkansas i've heard you talk about before he's going to be he plays he's going to play center at the next level correct i or maybe not that's what 
that's what big draft media seems to think that he's going to play center. Okay. I would, I would, think? I would pound the table to play him at guard. I, I would be okay. stoked if, if the Titans were to draft him and slide him over to red right guard, I would be happy with that. Watched his Alabama tape from 2022. This kid got some wins over Will Anderson. I don't know if you guys have heard of Will Anderson, but he's a pretty good, good football player. Mm-hmm. So I, I, I value that. Fair enough. Fair enough. Um, so like, I don't know. I, okay. Yeah. I'm, it's a thought that I'm going to, I'm going to save it for a little bit later. Cause I think it's, it's okay. a good one. And it, it pertains more to some of these top guys. So let's keep trucking here. So that, that's Bo Limmer uh, out of Arkansas. We've got Mason McCormick out of San Diego state university at number 10 for me at number nine. And then on your board at 10 and at eight at number nine on your board is Delmar glaze, a great name for a player out of Maryland. What do people need, need to know about Delmar? He's a, uh, a big, thick guy. He's a thumper. He's got really strong hands, can really punch a shoulder out. He played tackle. He has experience at left tackle and right tackle at Maryland. But, man, you start to see him against some of these quick, twitchy speed rushers, and you, you really notice how limited his athletic range is out there on the edge. That's why I think uh, a, a lot of folks think he's going to kick into guard where he should find some success in the NFL. He's got a mean streak to go with it. He's a guy that likes to, to pick you up and throw you in the dirt. Fair enough. I just noticed I was wrong. We actually do have two guys not in common. So let's go to the guy that's uh, number seven on your board, Christian Mahogany out of Boston College. He comes in on the consensus board at number 94. So we're into the top 100 guys here. He's your seventh interior player a guard, if I'm not mistaken, you know, you've not, I don't think many folks have heard of Christian Mahogany's name thrown around in this draft cycle. Maybe why is that? And why should he be involved in the conversation? Yeah, I, I don't think he's been like a, a top level prospect. I mean, he got some eyeballs on him at the Shrine Bowl. I remember when he was announced as accepting his invite, there were some people that had kind of already been grinding his tape that were like, oh yeah, this di- this guy's going to be a riser throughout this process. And that was the thing that kind of signaled to me, hey, I got to go find some Boston College offensive all 22 to watch this guy. But he is a, he's a big, thick guy he plays with violence the same way we talked about uh, on yesterday's episode with Talisi Fuanga is he's just, he's got that mean streak in him as a run blocker. He's just going to mow you down. I watched his tape against Virginia and there was one play that I, I sat and watched it a couple of times. Like I think he just hit two different guys three different times on this play, like literally (laughs) just play (laughs) going back and forth, just hitting these guys. I'm like, why do y'all keep getting up? Just stay down at a certain point. There was a play where where like they snapped the ball and he effectively just picked the defensive lineman up and drove him back out of the play. It was, um, it was really, really something to watch. And, you know, I think for the, for, for the right offense, somebody that needs a, a road grader at right guard, I think he's uh, he's quite the candidate to fill that role. So that's Christian Mahogany at a uh, I keep saying BC and for some reason British Columbia is what comes to my head. No, <laughs> Boston College. Uh, Dominic Pooney is a guy out of Kansas who I, I've heard you talk about before, Stoney. Mm-hmm. And unless is he higher on your list or is he not on your top ten list here? No, he's he's higher on my list. Okay, I so actually, okay. Okay. I think I'm higher on him. I'm. Higher on him than the consensus, more so than any other player. I think he's a fringe first rounder, wow. in my opinion. I think he has some real uh, versatility to his game. I think that I, I understand the concerns, the limitations with the tape, but I I would say um, this Kansas offense, uh, to, to put it in, to dumb it down as much as I can. I, it feels like they're five different offenses blended into one. Hmm. It's really hard. They, they run the ball a lot. There's a lot of option stuff and they're like formations where they've got like two linemen in front of the quarterback and then everybody else is lined up past the uh, the numbers and it makes it really hard to get a read on what Pooney is as a prospect, but he's also never allowed a sack in his entire career. He's got great length. Wow. He's got a, a really feisty style to him. He looks to hit somebody. I think the, um, the thinking was that he was going to slide into guard where um, – you know, I kind of thought, yeah, I, I can see it with the power, the tenacity, um, experience in, in a run heavy scheme checks that checks those boxes. That's fine. No issue with that. But then when he got to the senior bowl, they moved this kid in the center and had him snapping the ball really clean snaps. I thought he was really effective in tracking movement 
from stunts, guys trying to cross over, getting his hands up, really good footwork. And, and I kind of thought the more I heard people talk about him, like, yeah, this guy's future might be at center in this um, in this draft class. And that you kind of broaden your scope a little bit. And it's like, okay, experience at tackle. Looks like he could play guard. Really looks like he could play center. This is a guy that has versatility like few other offensive linemen have in this class. And, uh, you know, you, you have to do a little bit of projecting because, like I said, I, I feel like that Kansas tape is kind of hard to, to make sense of at times. But I think just looking at the traits and the experience alone, I, I think he's he's one of the best. I've got him. He's three or four on my list. Wow. OK, so we'll, we'll see him on your list in a minute. He's a guy that you think could be a fringe first round, second round player. Based uh, on a, my evaluation, sure, I don't think sure. NFL people are saying that. <laughs> okay, Just well, if, you know, if, he, if he fall the way that he's expected to, he becomes an interesting potential option for the Titans just because his former coach, his college coach, Scott Fuchs, uh, the Titans uh, assist, I believe his title is assistant offensive line coach, but mm -hmm. he is part of the dynamic duo for the Titans offensive line brain trust that has like 134 years of coaching combined. Um, he knows he knows uh, a, a Dominic Pooney really, really well. And so, you know, I don't know whether or not the Titans are considering him or not, but if they were to, you, you'd have confidence, you know, they made a good choice because they know this guy better than most teams do. I'll be doing cartwheels if he ends up with the Titans. Okay, fair enough. Another player that I have on my list, but not maybe not on your, maybe he's higher and I'm still missing him here. Cedric Van Pran out of Georgia. I'd imagine he's probably not on your list. He's number eight on mine. Center out of Georgia, high IQ player. Um, first guy on this list really so far that I, I feel like I can speak some to because he's the full disclosure, the first guy on this list that I've actually put a significant amount of time into. I, I leave the, the lineman evaluation to the, the pros like Stoney for the most part and, and focus on the top guys. Cedric Van Pran is, uh, I think JT referred to him as the quintessential PFF mock draft player of the year earlier because he just was consistently a guy that I, you would see in PFF mock drafts and then not really hear a whole lot else about. I think that he's somebody that um, could project well to uh, a handful of different schemes. He's got the IQ that you're looking for in a center and just had a solid college experience. Again, not a whole lot of flash, but like above av at or above average in pretty much every element of his game. And so that's why I have him at number eight. Yeah, it's funny. I'm just reading over my uh, my report on him, and I I mentioned something about like why is he lunging so much? And I mentioned that on yesterday's show with Amarius Mims. Maybe it is a coaching thing at Georgia where they're just like, oh, hey, if you don't if you don't know what to do, just duck your head and lunge forward. I don't know. I I think I think he's he's kind of built funny to me, and and this is one of those weird really? edge. Edger and Cooper's legs are too long kind of thing for me, right? Like, the way he springs out of his stance, I, I feel like his pads are too high. I felt like he got knocked off balance a little bit um, on the tape, but all in all, like pretty clean uh, player, pretty clean snaps, like not a lot of issues getting the ball out and a uh, really powerful guy, really strong hitter. I got no issue with him. Actually, if I'm making a if i'm combining my list like i told you i've got them separated into guards and centers on mine but mm -hmm. i think he's probably number 11 for me okay okay so just off of your list fair just enough. just off of my list yeah let's keep trucking to get these top guys in here uh number six for both of us is cooper beeb i believe i'm saying that correctly out of kansas state who i think would be higher on these lists if he didn't quite have the athletic limitations that he presents sure um a very fast player 93rd percentile 40 yard dash however um not not the strongest athlete on tape and he, he he's lacking in the length that's what keeps him as an interior player but um i think he's i think he's pretty bright he's got a high iq from what i've read uh what makes him number six on your board Man, you basically read my scouting report for me. The only thing I was at, I would add, is that he's got a really wide base, and I think it makes him a pretty sturdy, strong prospect. And and I think that gets to the crux of why I think he's got a high floor at the next level. He's just a across the board. He's a safe prospect, man. Like he he's somebody that we talk about offensive linemen kind of needing some time to catch on when they get to the NFL. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's going to be the case with him. I, I don't think he's going to be out, you know, blowing anybody away or anything like that. But I think his tape shows a, a pretty high safe floor. So you could draft this guy in the second round and trust that you've got your left guard spot locked down. And Bebe on the consensus board comes in at 
uh, I have, I'm having a hard time saying consensus board. Yeah, it's just got to slow we've, it down. We said it a lot. I know. I it's it's becoming. <laughs> you know, when you say a word over and over and over, and it loses its meaning. That's where we're at at this point. On the consensus board, Beeb is at 64 overall. So we're firmly into the second day, second round territory as we talk about these next couple guys. JT, let's throw up the top five lists here. And uh, so at number five, okay. So at number five is where you have Dominic Puni, who you're mm. a little bit higher on. Let's let's do Christian Haynes out of UConn. He's your third line interior offensive lineman. My number five player uh, going to play the guard position at the next level. What did you like enough about Haynes to have him at number three? Oh, man, I think he is. Uh, he's just a ton of fun to watch, man. A pot bellied behemoth is what I call him. He just wants to maul people. The, the, the ability for Stoney to continue to make different <laughs> acronyms for thick men is I know. something that needs to truly be studied. I, My I favorite take, of his of all time was last year where he said he's got a little bit of a fee fi fo bum to him. Which is yes, a great, Steven great Mila. draft jargon. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I've used that a few times this draft cycle. It's good too. stuff. Yeah, uh, it, really good with his hands. He he kind of knows. He has a good sense of when a situation calls for him, just completely decleating a guy, and when he needs to, you know, get his hands on a guy and and wrestle wrestle him. Uh, seeks out content at the second level. Vice grips for hands. There's an immovable quality to him. He can just sink his hips, plant his feet, establish his base. Good get off a uh, walking reminder of quote, low man wins. Mm. Uh, I don't have a problem if anybody wants to take Christian Haynes in the first round. Fair enough. Fair enough. I really, yeah. I really enjoyed. He was one of my favorite prospects to see at the senior bowl. I think out, right. out of the offensive line groups, he was one that really stood out to me with the Patrick Pauls and someone else we're going to talk about on this list, Jackson powers, Johnson, who I think yeah. is a really interesting conversation. This, this draft cycle, um, Christian Haynes, I think is a guy who continues to rise and man, he he's, I think he can be an impact starter from day one. Yeah. Also worthy of note is that he frustrated Jordan Jefferson to the point that he took off his helmet and swung it at Christian Haynes. And if I'm not mistaken, I don't know if this was officially reported anywhere, but the, the, the word on the street was that Haynes looked at him and said, if you're scared, go to church. And mm. that is hard as hell. That is hard as hell. It really, I mean, that's, that's a bar. I like that. <laughs> I like that exactly. a lot. Um, okay. Before we get to, you know, actually let's, let's do Zach Frazier. Who's number four on my board. Number four on yours interior player out of West Virginia university. Stoney, what did you like about Frazier when you watched him on tape? He comes in on the consensus board at number 45 overall. Yeah. I, I mean, you want to talk about pardon, pardon my French, pardon my language here, but an ass kicker, like mm. that's that's Zach Frazier. If not okay. for the if not for the injury concerns, I, I think Frazier would be pushing Jackson Powers Johnson for the number one center spot on my list. I, I just love there's something about his mentality and the way that he plays. If you haven't watched the the Penn State tape, I highly recommend it. It's some of my favorite tape I've watched this cycle. The confidence that West Virginia could just line up on fourth and one run it up the middle. And they knew they were going to convert whenever they needed to just running behind their center. Zach Frazier is just uncanny. And they're even, they're down like 40 to 20 or something in the fourth quarter of this game. And Zach Frazier is still out there playing his guts out. I mean, the guy, the guy is a grinder. He is a fighter. He's got a wrestling background that shows up in pass protection when he can get a get a get his hands on a guy. I think he's a really complete prospect. The injuries are are a concern, but for him to get back and do the drills at the scouting combine as quickly as he did is uh, pretty impressive as well. I, I just I, I love to watch him play. If if you're a team that that runs the ball quite a bit and wants to be a statement running team, I think he's your center. Four-time state wrestling champion in high yeah. school, so he's got crazy core strength. Um, and it, despite the lacking length, he he's just going to win in a mud fight in the middle of the line. So I agree entirely. That's why I have him at number four on my board as well. My favorite, my favorite part of of doing different mock drafts like this to, to what you said, Stony, is mocking the Eagles trading up into up into the uh, first part of the second round to take Zach Frazier's just oh, so that they can annoy people with the tush push for another 10 years. <laughs> That's I, the I guy that, you need. That's the I, guy I you think, need. I think he, I think you can't tell me Howie Roseman isn't looking at that and like Jalen hurts is pounding the table being like, I need another 15 rushing touchdowns the side from the like. one. Yeah. I need this guy in front of me now. Um, yeah. I, I think, I think 
that would be a very interesting one. But like you said, I think he ha- he possesses a lot of power, and I think that's one of his best parts of his game. Before we get to the top two guys, can we reiterate just a little bit, Stoney, on Jordan Morgan out of Arizona, who played tackle at the college level, depending on who you ask, as a guard or a tackle prospect in this process. I think we both agree he's likely to be a guard at the next level, just depends on where he is uh, drafted and where he fits in on a team. But man, if like if you get past the part that, oh man, he was a tackle in college, we are excited for him to be a tackle prospect, he's probably just not going to play tackle at the NFL level. Still a really fantastic interior offensive lineman. He's number three on my board. I'm not quite sure where you'd have him slotted in uh, if you because you had him on your tackle list. But if you had to put him on your on your guard center list here, the interior, where would he fit for you? He would probably be sixth, just okay. ahead of of uh, Cooper B. Cooper B. Okay. B. 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 Whichever it is, I like saying B. B. because it's more fun. Sure, but I, I think he would probably be there at six, just behind Pooney, uh, because of. You know, the the balance still counts for something. The hand usage still counts for something if you're kicking inside to guard. And then you don't have with Morgan. One of my big concerns with him is his ability to kind of overset at the edge and allow guys to rush inside. And you don't have to worry about that if you're not playing out in space. So I think it probably does give him a higher floor and maybe a higher ceiling as well to to kick inside. I just I just think somebody's going to give him a chance at tackle. And you do. Um, that's why okay. I didn't I didn't put him on this list. But if I did, he'd be there just outside the top five. OK, fair enough. And if you want to hear more on him, we talked a little bit about him in the top 10 tackles episode, which as we're here, here live, we did it a couple of minutes ago. But uh, <laughs> on the podcast feed, it was the last day or two things. It was recently. Go find the top 10 tackles episode if you want to hear more on Jordan Morgan. OK, our top two guys here. We are in lockstep. Number two is Jackson Powers Johnson out of Oregon and then Graham Barton out of Duke. Let's start with Jackson Powers Johnson, who is built like SpongeBob. He's the most square frame, like just he's built. <laughs> he's built different in a, in the most wonderful, delicious way for an interior offensive lineman. Um, I, we loved everything about him from what we saw at the Senior Bowl. He won every day that he participated. What what is there to love about JPJ Stony? And can, talk me through maybe some of the downsides, the reasons why to, to let folks in on like the the zeitgeist with the draft media. It seems like he's fallen down boards, and, and I don't really know why. Yeah, I, I don't know uh, myself. I don't know what information would have come to light uh, that would have his stock yeah, plummeting. Could be medicals that we'll never know, but right. Yeah, but if you just stick to the tape and you stick to like what we saw at the Senior Bowl down in he's Mobile. He's a first rounder. He's a first rounder, really yes. clean prospect, of effective hand usage. You don't see too many centers that are built like him that can move like him mm-hmm. i mean this this is a big dude we're talking about that that's playing Six, the three 320 at center yeah I, I mean he can you want to talk about a team that wants to to line up and mow people down like he he's your he's your dude i think he's a very very technically sound center the only thing i can conceive of i, I mean they kicked him out to guard at some down in mobile to see how he would play there and i thought it kind of exposed maybe some of his lateral quickness, like he did kind of feel a little stiff. Like that's where you see a dude who's built like a barrel is when you put him out there and, and try to get him against some of the, the twitchier pass rushers and interior hybrid defensive lineman types. I wasn't as confident in him at guard as some of the other draft media were that were just saying, oh, you can start him wherever you need to start him on mm-hmm. the offensive line. I didn't necessarily see that. I don't know if that's if this is a case where – hey, maybe the NFL sees something like that too, and it's been this way this whole time, and maybe draft media just got super hyped up off of that senior bowl, and we inflated his stock to uh, an unrealistic place. I don't know, but it's my best guess. Fair enough. Fair enough. I think there's a really interesting conversation because, like you said, between like there are situations like with a Jermaine Burton where you where you're hearing that the vibes are just off, and oh, that's yeah. why uh, you you see his stock falling. And then you have cases like Jackson Powers Johnson, where it kind of feels like maybe the opposite that teams are being quiet intentionally because they they want they want you to kind of seemingly forget about this guy. Yeah. Um, and I think that's the great experiment of the NFL draft that in. Uh, 12 or 13 days, we're going to finally see, and then we'll get our answer and be like, we'll truly know, like, is there something more to this? Or is it simply this guy is really good. Let's not talk about him so that we can get him. 
He's so good. I don't see how he can't be a first round pick. I, I think medical. I'm with you. It has I, to be I, medical. I, mm-hmm. Potentially. Yeah. I, I think there might be something to that. Um, but like, like you said, it's just, once again, something that we just don't have access to. All right. And that leaves us with our number one player, a Brentwood, Tennessee legend, Graham Barton out of Duke went to Ravenwood. If you're from the area, the middle Tennessee area. Um, so he, you know what? He, he could technically be a local visit for the Titans if they wanted to make him that he is the number one offense, interior offensive lineman on both Stony and eyes board for good reason. Six foot five, 311 pounds. Played a good bit. He played exclusively at tackle in college, correct? Or am I making that up? He played tackle and guard. Okay, so he did play some guard. Yeah. I know but, everybody projects him as a center in the end, right. but I don't think – I think that's all projection-based. I think he actually played guard when he I'm kicked double inside that real two. quick. But um, regardless – well, let me see. No, so yeah, just kidding. No, he played left tackle all through. All through college. Oh, did he? He didn't, yeah, yeah, all through. So um a ton of experience at the tackle position, but it's that length that's going to keep him as an interior player at the NFL level. Um, I'm gonna pull up his length here in just a second. And yeah, for the Wings- record, sure. I, I said it about Jordan Morgan. I said it about Peter Skaronsky. I you if, you wanna, Bart. if you want to give Graham Barton a shot at tackle, be my guest. Well, he's got 32 and seven eighths inch arms, which I believe is that I think that's the exact same as Peter mm-hmm. Skaronsky. I could be wrong. Yeah. Um, so kind of same deal. And uh, he's certainly a strong enough athlete to tempt a team to try that. But wherever he's playing on the offensive line, whether it's inside or outside, he's a menace. He's a fantastic player, was really great at Duke, came into this draft cycle as one of the number one talked about uh, offensive linemen just in general, interior or uh, exterior. And I feel like he's been drowned out a little bit unfairly because I think he's a I, I would say he's a lock first rounder barring some medical issues. And I think some team's going to get a fantastic lineman wherever he lines up. Yeah, I don't know where you put him. And that's that's why I have difficulty projecting where he's going to go as far as mm-hmm. like draft stock goes. But watching the tape, he's one of my favorite players in this draft because he's he's just electric to watch. I mean, this guy gets out in space. He moves well, but he's also a wrecking ball. Like He just looks for somebody to completely obliterate. <laughs> and he <laughs> I saw Jake mention the, the titty twisters for Christian Haynes. But to me, Graham it's Barton, Graham Barton stat. Graham Barton is the king of the titty twisters in this class. The way he just <laughs> okay. he gets it. That's what it looked like to me. The way he just get his hands inside, yeah, and lift a dude up, and it's just like, man, that's got to be he's clamping down right. Titty there. twisters that's, are a Graham Barton stat. That's got to hurt. <laughs> that's analytics right there. Yeah, <laughs> that's got to hurt something. Sure, really, sure. really fun to watch. A really clean prospect in his own right. I just, you know, like I said, I just wonder what you do with him. That's fair. I, I think teams are gonna keep it simple and, and start him in on the interior. I I don't know. Like the more you look at his profile, the more you, you could convince yourself depending on what you need really with any situation. But I think if he's going to be the first rounder that I expect him to be, it's going to be a team looking to get one of the top on their board, interior offensive lineman guys, mm-hmm. plug him in at center or at guard, put him on, you know, a like Dallas Cowboys, something like that could be a really fantastic ad. Yeah, I would agree, and I think he's also a guy that you could probably just get into camp and figure out your best five and where he fits in that too. Right, just just draft the the talent and yeah. say we're, mm-hmm. you know not knowing where we're going to play him is maybe a good problem to have because we just know he's good at football and we'll figure it out for sure. All right, that's our top ten lists, fellas. We got through both the top ten tackles and the top ten interior offensive linemen in a cool hour forty five. Not bad, honestly, better than I thought we were going to do. So we appreciate better every- than last year. Oh, last year, Stoney, you it was just you and my you and I, and we did north of three hours for the, both. That's of them. okay. So, that's what I was thinking. Um, it's, the, it's the producer JT effect, right here. Yeah, yeah. The timekeeper <laughs> kept us honest. Every every ten seconds, he was texting me, "Stop, shut up, move on." Uh, not really, but I could I could feel it. I feel the energy, and so I appreciate you keeping it. It's like it's here. like you know, like the mom stare, you know, when at your kid, just like looking with, at him. You're with company. The- you're with company, and you're acting up, and mom gives you that look that you're going to get your <laughs> you're going to get whooped on later, and you better stop right now, or it's just going to get worse. Yeah, a hundred percent. I was I was trying to keep it concise, but sometimes my, like my passion just kind of sinks through on these things. And you know what? That's why we love having you on here, Stony. Um, you you are you would you are the reason why we can do these offensive line episodes and not sound like morons because it is a different evaluating NFL players 
it, it, as a whole outside of linemen it is like, it feels like different sports doing the two things. <laughs> um, it, 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 it's difficult. And uh, a guy like you who really knows what he's talking about is, is a huge credit to our show. So we appreciate you being willing to do it. Uh, tell the people where they need to find you. Obviously you're on F words now all the time on Tuesdays. So check Wednesday. it out here on the four, four Wednesdays. I'm bad mm-hmm. job on my part on Wednesdays. Uh, you're trying to do one o'clock, right? Wednesdays at one o'clock. Yep. Okay. Wherever, wherever you take in your, your four forty sports or your Broadway sports. Yeah. And then the Sobros network, um, smelling candles, reviewing right. movies, yep. getting outside, doing everything. I mean, like it's the <laughs> most, it is the most eclectic collection of media in the city. And it's a very, well, it's a good thing. It's wonderful. It's delightful. Thank you. It's been lacking a little bit lately because I've been working so hard to try and get this draft guide wrapped up, but I promise we'll get back to all the the restaurant reviews and people fighting at malls and stuff like that. Well, the three of us were talking earlier today. We're going to go up to that. There's a wonderfully picturesque Chili's in Canada somewhere that we're going to find exactly. a ski lodge and we're going to do a show live from there and get rum buckets and pass out in Canada and Canadian Chili's, I guess. That's living that's the dream. Planned. Well, that's we'll celebrate the end of draft season by doing that. So we'll uh, there we go. We'll make some content out of that. Uh, Stoney, thank you for being here. For everybody that Anytime. tuned in with us live and, and wrote it out the whole hour 45. Kudos to you, man. We need to get you a t-shirt or a button or something. <laughs> you guys rock. We appreciate you supporting the show because you guys are the reason we do this. Like I mentioned at the top of the show, a lot more content coming to you from the Hot Read Podcast side of things. Tomorrow, Monday, Monday the uh, 15th, we'll be live again. JT and I are talking through all of the multiversal options the Titans have at the number one or in, in round one at the number seven pick overall. We're going to talk through our rankings of what could happen and based on what does happen, what might happen after that. We'll talk through all of those possibilities tomorrow, rank them, have a good time. It's all based on the survey that I did on Twitter that hundreds of you voted on. So if you voted, come and hear about how those results turned out. They really are fascinating. And then on Tuesday, JT and I will be talking through running backs and safeties. And then on Thursday, we'll be back again. Another double episode talking through edges and cornerbacks. And then next week is draft week and we'll we'll have content for you like every single day. It'll be a good time. So tune in to all of our content and all of the 440 podcast network and all of the Broadway Sports Media podcast network content for the next couple of days as we near the draft just one week from Thursday. Until then, for producer JT, I'm your host, Easton Freeze. And for our guest, Tony Keeley, we appreciate you listening. This has been the Hot Read Podcast and we'll talk to you tomorrow.